Ever since I was a little girl, I have seen this in various forms. God is my co-pilot. And I used to think that was just the coolest thing. And then I began to realize, now wait a minute, God is my co-pilot? God should be my pilot, right? I mean, a co-pilot is kind of someone who sits over there and does crossword puzzles while you do everything else, right? I mean, the captain is the one who is setting the course, making all the decisions, you know, they're in charge. And the co-pilot is kind of there in case an engine goes out or bad weather comes in or something like that. So the alternate title to this sermon is God is not my co-pilot. Because Emmanuel, God with us, is not about God coming along as a little assistant when we can't handle it ourselves. No. Emmanuel, God with us, is, is God being in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, us needing Him, relying on Him, depending on Him for everything. That, we want God to fix our problems, and it is the crisis. It is the crisis that, that draws us to Him. But in the crisis, God doesn't want to fix our problem. He wants to fix us. He wants to take those crises in our lives and use them to mold us and shape us into his character to bring us oneness with Christ. That is really what those, what those hard times are for. James talks about it. James chapter 1, one of those passages of scripture you love to hate, right? In the Phillips translation, it says, welcome troubles as friends. <laughs> But here in the NIV, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God is not concerned about our flesh. He's concerned about our character and our heart. As much as God wants to heal us of cancer and and give us that job that we need and increase our provision. He's more concerned about us becoming in the image of his son, Jesus. That is his primary goal for each of us. That is our highest calling, is to be made in the image of Christ. That is even a higher calling than whatever, whatever skill that he's given us to do. Our destiny is to be a sons and daughters of God. And that is what Emmanuel came to do. Keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus is a very important thing to do as well. I forgot, I still need my Bible. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4, 17 talks about the importance of keeping the right perspective. Paul says, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And in the midst of those trials, it's so easy, isn't it, just to focus on what's happening right here and to forget that the majority of what we're worried about is just temporary stuff that's going to go away. But keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus every day as we walk through the day, those fears come and those doubts come, and we say, no, I choose to trust in my Father. I will walk by faith and not by sight. That is how Emmanuel comes into us on that daily basis where we can walk with him. It is important to realize, though, that we can miss the coming of Messiah. When I go back to the Christmas story, so few people knew that Jesus had come. Think about it. How many people in the world knew that Jesus had come that day? Just a handful of people. The, the place where that stands out most to me is in the last scripture reading that we did where Simeon and Anna are there at the temple. They're well along in years. They're at the end of their race. And they're holding on to see Messiah. And in he comes, and they see him, and they worship. But did you think about how many Pharisees were in the temple that day? How many teachers of the law? How many scribes? The greatest minds of that day, the people who knew more about the Old Testament prophecies than anybody else, they missed it that day. They totally missed the coming of Messiah. And why? They were not seeking him. Simeon was. And so was Anna. They were seeking the consolation of Israel. And there were others that were like-minded, and they were sure to share the Messiah with them. But the greatest minds of that day completely missed the coming of Jesus. Don't think that you can't miss a great revelation of God, because you can, and so can I. Our pride can keep us from it. Our selfishness. Our fear, sometimes. Sometimes I feel like the Christian life is like a big onion with all these layers. 
You know, and God deals with the layer, and whew, wow, he dealt with that. And then there's another layer. And then there's another layer. You know, and it's just layer upon layer. But, but the Christian walk is an adventure. It is not God my co-pilot, right? It's not God my fire insurance. It's not God my get out of jail free card. It's not God my lucky rabbit's foot. That's not what God is. He didn't come just to save us from hell. And I'm so glad he did, but he came to save us from ourselves. He came to transform us and give us a life of purpose. The last thing I want to talk to you about is, is a little truth that God showed me recently about our weaknesses and about grace. I've been dealing with a few weaknesses in my own life. He's been working on this one onion layer for a while now, and I think we're getting close. I think we're getting close to getting through to the next layer, but I know I'm, I'm still in process, and I was feeling really bad day, uh, one day because of my little struggle with my little onion layer. And, uh, and, but God showed me, Julie, I know you're weak. You don't have to feel guilty that you're weak, but you're coming to me. You're dependent. And in your weakness, that's when I can be strong. And so I took a look at that verse of Scripture, and it's in 2 Corinthians here, chapter 12. Give me just a second to find it. And it's where Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh. And he asked God, please take it away. And God said, I'm not going to do it. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this one verse, I want to I show you a little nugget that God gave me. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That word perfect is the Greek word teleo. It means complete, finished. It is the same Greek word that is used when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Do any of you doubt that the saving work of Christ on the cross is complete? I don't think so. But how much do we doubt that his power can be teleo in us, can be complete in our weaknesses? It is just as complete as that work on the cross. That blessed me. That blessed me so much. So we will glory in our weaknesses because they make us dependent on him. And it is that dependency on him that allows us to receive Emmanuel.